Hello, poetry lovers and poetry curious. So I'm reading to you once again from Galway Cannell's A New and Selected Poems, published in 2000 and 2001. I'm going in a little bit blind here, so I know that I like this because I marked it in the table of contents, but it's been a long time since I read it. But it's as much the form that has Im impelled me <laughs> to, to read it to you here, to go into it. So I just was looking at the form and I thought, you know what, I'm going to read this to them just as an example of something interesting being done in form. But this is going to be longer because it's ten stanzas. And, it's, and each stanza is presented on a different page. And each stanza begins with the same line and ends with the same line. So every single one of these stanzas has the same first line and the same last line. Now that, when I see that happening, I immediately think, and plus seeing them spaced on each, um, on each page, as opposed to, like, stanza two going underneath stanza one on the same page. We have each stanza on a separate page. Makes me think of something called a crown of sonnets. But not even a crown of sonnets has the same first and last line throughout. Usually it's just that the last line of the first stanza will become the first line of the second stanza. And then the last line of the second stanza will be different and will be the first line of the third stanza. Now that's hard enough to do, but well, let's see if Galway Canal can hold our interest repeating the same line would be 20 times. And encompassing within it a 13-line stanza. So even though you would say, I look at it and I think this is a crown of son sonnets, he is intentionally disrupting that by making each stanza 13 lines, not 14 lines of a sonnet. And I'm not entirely sure why he's doing that. But I would assume that there's a reason because it's a very pointed sort of thing to do. <laughs> um... The title of this poem is one, When One Has Lived a Long Time Alone. So here we go, we're taking the dive. When one has lived a long time alone, one refrains from swatting the fly and lets him go, and one is slow to strike the mosquito, though more than willing to slap the flesh under her, and one hoists the toad from the pit too deep to hop out of, and carries him to the grass without minding the poisoned urine he slicks his body with. And one envelops in a towel the swift who fell down the chimney and knocks herself against window glass and releases her outside and watches her fly free, a lifeline hung at, flung at reality when one has lived a long time alone. Two. When one has lived a long time alone, one grabs the snake behind the head and holds him until he stops trying to stick that, the orange tongue which forks at the end into black filaments and flashes out like a fire eater's breath and bears little resemblance to the pimpled pink lump that mostly dozes inside the human mouth. Into one's flesh and clamps it between his jaws, letting the gaudy tip show, as children do when concentrating, and very likely one does oneself without knowing it when one has lived a long time alone. Number three. When one has lived a long time alone, among regrets so immense the past occupies nearly all the rooms there is in consciousness. 
one notices in the snake's eyes, which see behind, without giving any less attention to the future, the opaque, milky-blue cloudiness that comes when the snake is about to throw its skin and become new, meanwhile continuing, of course, to grow old. The same blue passé that bleaches the corneas of the blue-eyed when they when they lie back at the end and look for heaven. A fading one suspects means they don't find it when one has lived a long time alone. Number four, when one has lived a long time alone, one falls to pouring upon a creature, contrasting its eternity's face to one's own full of hours, taking note of the differences, exaggerating them, making them everything, until the other is utterly other, and then, with hard effort, probably with tongue sticking out, going over each difference again, and this time canceling it until nothing is left but likeness, and suddenly oneness, and minutes later one starts awake, taken aback at how unresistingly one drops off into the bliss of kinship when one has lived a long time alone. Number five. When one has lived a long time alone and listens at morning to morning doves, sound their kiri elizan, or to the small thing spiritualizing upon a twig cry, piwit phoebe, or to grasshoppers scratching their thighs need fire awake, or to peabody birds at midday send their schoolboys whistle, whistlings across the field, and at dusk their undamped chinks, as from marble cutters' chisels, or at nightfall to pollywigs, or excuse me, pollywogs, just rearranged into frogs, raise their ave verum corpus. Listens to those who hop or fly, call down upon us the mercy of other tongues. One hears them as inner voices when one has lived a long time alone. Number six, when love, excuse me, when one has lived a long time alone, one knows that consciousness consummates. And as the most self-conscious one among these others, uttering their seemingly compulsory cries, the least flycatcher witching up Chebec, or a red-headed woodpecker clanging out his tunes from a metal gutter metal roof gutter, or ruffed grouse drumming thrum, 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 thrump, thrump, rup, 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 deep in the woods, all of them in times unfolding, trying to cry themselves into self-knowing. One knows one is here to hear them into shining when one has lived a long time alone. Seven. When one has lived a long time alone, one likes alike the pig who brooks no deferment of gratification and the porcupine or thorned pig who enters the cellar but not the house itself because of eating down the cellar stairways on the way up. And one likes the worm who by bunching herself together and expanding works her way through the ground no less than the butterfly who totters full of worry among the day-lilies as they darken. And more and more one finds one likes any other species better than one's own, which has gone amuck, making one self-estranged when one has lived a long time alone. Number eight. When one has lived a long time alone, sour, misanthropic, one fits to one's defiance, the satanic boast. It is better to reign in hell than to submit on earth, and forgets one's kind, the way by now the snake does, who stops trying to get to the floor and lingers all across one's body, slumping into its contours, adopting its temperature, and abandons hope of the sweetness of friendship or love, 
before long can barely remember what they are and covets the stillness of inorganic, inorganic matter. In a self-dissolution, one may not know how to halt when one has lived a long time alone. Number nine. When one has lived a long time alone, and the hermit thrush calls and there is an answer, and the bullfrog head half out of the water utters the cantillations he sang in his first spring, and the snake lowers himself over the threshold and creeps away among the stones, one sees they all live to mate with their kind, and one knows, after a long time of solitude, after the many steps taken away from one's kind, toward these other kingdoms, the hard prayer inside one's own singing is to come back, if one can, to one's own, a world almost lost in the exile that deepens when one has lived a long time alone. Number 10. When one has lived a long time alone, one wants to live again among men and women, to return to that place where one's ties with the human broke, where the disquiet of death and now also of history glimmers its firelight on faces, where the gaze of the new baby meets the gaze of the great granny, and where lovers speak on lips blousy from kissing, that language the same in each mouth, and like birds at daybreak, leather the song that is both earth's and heaven's, until the sun rises and they stand in the daylight of being made one, kingdom come, when one has lived a long time alone. So, you can tell me, did it get tiresome when one has lived a long time alone? Or did, I, you know, I like nature poetry, so he can talk about snakes and birds, whatever, as long as he likes. Um, but I'm, I'm curious if for other people that got tiresome. And there's, there's a part of me that, and I'm a very, very, very solitary person. And so in the end, he comes to a conclusion. In the end, he comes to a conclusion that the solitude and seeing that the other creatures want to go back with other creatures that are like them makes him want to return. I've never been entirely isolated. I mean, really, even in COVID, you know, there's, you gotta, you gotta eat. <laughs> You gotta go out and do stuff. Um, so I don't know that I've ever been quite as isolated as he's talking about here, which sounds like a complete, like living out in the woods and not communicating with anybody and being completely alone. It sounds like for a year or at least more than one season. Um, you know, would you feel compelled? Would you, to return, would you feel a renewed attraction to your own kind as you returned? Would you ever want to become that separated? You know, I'm a very solitary person. I think in younger days, I wouldn't have minded becoming that isolated. But as an old person, not so much. So that's it. That's my last poem from Galway Canal's A New Selected Poems. He's definitely a poet worth, uh, worth reading. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.